Okay, stop me if you've heard this one. How can you tell if an elephant has been in your refrigerator? <gasps> From the footprints in the butter. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't get it either. Welcome to Teacup for One. My name is Matt and I have two degrees. And today we are going to do something on the channel I have not done yet. I am going to review a brand new movie. The originally intended for theaters, but not anticipated enough to justify waiting until they reopen, so it went straight to Disney Plus, the one and only Ivan. That's right, I'm reviewing that movie about the gorilla who finger paints. Okay, well, it's about a little bit more than that. The one and only Ivan is based on an award-winning 2012 children's novel by Catherine Applegate, which in and of itself is loosely based on the real-life events of a westward lowland gorilla named Ivan. Oh, also, spoiler warning. I mean, this movie is, like, very, very predictable, but still. Spoiler warning. Now the story of Ivan is an unfortunately all too familiar tale about a wild animal being kept in captivity under the guise of protection when let's be honest it's really just for the amusement and profit of human beings. Ivan is the main attraction at an in mall circus and honestly I don't even know if malls ever had circuses but I mean this movie has talking animals I'm willing to suspend my disbelief. And Ivan is pretty content with his life as the superstar in the mall until a brand new baby elephant named Ruby joins the cast and he starts to question whether or not it's beneficial to animals to be living in captivity. When I first saw the trailer for the one and only Ivan all I could think was didn't we get this movie last year and wasn't it called Dumbo? Because just think about it, with the one and only Ivan, you have a movie taking place at a circus with a baby elephant as the emotional core of the story, with a child who understands the animals in a way that the adults can't, and the overarching theme of the movie seems to be a comment on animals in captivity. And this was coming just a year after Dumbo, which was also a movie that took place at a circus with a baby elephant as the emotional core, with a child who understood the animals in a way that the adults couldn't, with an overarching theme of animals in captivity. What could this movie possibly do any differently from Dumbo, or what can it have to say that Dumbo has not already said? The answer, talking animals. Why do they want an angry gorilla anyway? Now, I will admit, I was a little on the fence about the talking animals at the start, and I mean, don't get me wrong, I love talking animal movies. We'll discuss that topic in a second. But my first thought was, if this is a story about an animal who is using his art and visuals to communicate with humans about how he wants to be free, it's going to be so much more powerful if the animals are not talking and they're allowing the visuals to speak for them. But Tim Burton already did the nonverbal animal communication thing pretty effectively in Dumbo last year. And the big difference is that Dumbo is a film seen through the eyes of the kids. But the one and only Ivan has the animals as the protagonists and the entire movie is seen through their eyes. Now, I haven't read the book, The One and Only Ivan, but from what I understand, a lot of the power of the novel comes from the fact that the entire thing is told from Ivan's first person or first gorilla perspective. There's a simplicity to how he sees and understands his world that we as the human readers are able to process and understand the sadness and how limited his worldview is, and the movie does a great job of recreating that. I suspect it's kind of like that other book that I haven't read but I have heard great things about, which was also turned into a movie, Room. Yeah, that's right. I bet you didn't think I'd be able to connect the adorable children's movie to the really dark and depressing Brie Larson Oscar vehicle, but here we are. As audience members, we're going into these stories knowing that the main character is being held captive and so there's kind of an expectation that we're going to be introduced to their world with uh, a feeling of sadness or restriction but instead we get joy room opens up with jack joyfully waking up and running around his living space and then in the one and only ivan he directly addresses the audience and proudly tells everyone about this in mall circus that is his home where he is the star. And as viewers, that's when the sadness really hits us deepest because we are realizing that these characters don't know anything outside of their own captivity. They don't know anything beyond the illusion of the self-contained little world that they have been raised in. There is actually an argument that could probably be made comparing the one and only Ivan 
to room to Plato's allegory of the cave, but neither of my degrees are in philosophy, so I'm not even going to open that door. Instead, let's talk about talking animals. First, we have to address the subgenres of the talking animal film. First off, 2D animation. We're talking Bambi, The Aristocats, Fox and the Hound. These are the movies that live action talking animal movies are trying to replicate. Why should you be first? Because I'm a lady, that's why. Now because it's a cartoon, you're able to suspend your disbelief with no problem whatsoever. And beyond that, the production design allows the animals to look like their real life counterparts, but be much more expressive. Next, live action with voiceover. So uh, think Homeward Bound. The savage beast spots his unsuspecting victim. Slowly he sneaks through the tall grass. Don't even. Obviously this is like the budget way to make a talking animal movie, but I think it is so effective because animals have such a beautiful spontaneity to their personalities and assuming that they're being treated well on set, I think it's so amazing seeing that captured on film. Next, Babe the Pig. He gets his own category because Babe the Pig and his movie set the bar for every talking animal movie ever. What's your name? I don't know. Well, what did your mother call you to tell you apart from your brothers and sisters? Our mom called us all the same. And what was that, dear? She, she called us all Babe. <laughs> babe won the Oscar for Best Visual Effects for a reason. They used real animals in conjunction with uh, puppets provided by the Jim Henson Creature Shop, and they pioneered some incredible CGI technology to articulate the mouths to make the animals look like they were talking. As far as I'm concerned, the real strength with Babe is how brilliantly and sparingly they used CGI. I think the extent of the animation is just a little bit to articulate the mouths so that they're in sync to the dialogue and a little bit of brow articulation, but for the most part, the performances are 100% from the animals. And even though the technology has advanced leaps and bounds since Babe was made, I don't think any movie has really come close to replicating its success just insofar as giving us realistic talking animals. And I think that's because now we're at a point where the technology is too good. And even if you do use real life animals like last year's live action Lady and the Tramp, the filmmakers tend to over animate. And so the real life animals on set almost become more like puppets than actual actors. Hey, don't push it. And that's kind of where we are right now in terms of live action talking animal movies. We have the technology to make them look photorealistic, which in some ways is absolutely incredible because it means that you don't have to subject actual animals to an on-set environment and then you're able to have exotic animals like the ones featured in The One and Only Ivan at the forefront of a movie in a way that would not have been possible previously. But then the trade-off with that is that as an audience member, watching an entire movie of photorealistic CGI animals, it's kind of weird. The technical term is the uncanny valley. It's that feeling or sensation of discomfort that you get when you're looking at something that is so photorealistic but has something just slightly off about it so that you know it's an unnatural imposter. So, for example, think of the Cats movie. Practical Cats! Cats. Actually, no, never think about the Cats movie. Think about the other Cats movie, Jon Favreau's live-action Lion King. One day, it'll be my son who rules. Simba would be your king. Did the animals look photorealistic? Yes. Did they talk? Yes. Was it weird? Absolutely. Because this is the thing. In real life, animals don't talk. They don't have the anatomy to talk the way that we speak. They don't have the articulators. They meow or they bark or they roar or they growl. Your job as a filmmaker is to create a world that is representing reality instead of trying to recreate it. And the good news is that the one and only Ivan is pretty successful at that. The movie does a lot of really smart things insofar as how it approaches the talking animals. First of all, even though their lips do move, you don't see it all that often. Either they're being obstructed by like trunks or feathers or something, or the animals are like framed in a wide shot so they're far enough away that you don't see the details of them articulating. The one exception 
is Ivan himself. Ivan is the most visually articulate of all the animals. Honestly, for the most part, it does work. Because first of all, again, the strength of the movie is the fact that this entire story is told from Ivan's perspective. And aesthetically speaking, Ivan's design is not a photorealistic gorilla. He is stylized. Now, not to the point where you watch the movie and think that it's like a live action Pixar hybrid, but he's just stylized enough to move us away from the uncanny valley. And it's a pretty successful magic trick to the point that in the credits when they show actual footage of the real life Ivan, you have a moment of, oh right, that's what an actual gorilla looks like. The result is a lovable leading character that you want to invest your time in watching. And that brings me to this movie's biggest strength which is the characters. My favorite was the bunny. And the voice cast is fantastic. You've got Oscar winner Sam Rockwell as Ivan, other Oscar winner Helen Mirren as an adorable fluffy poodle, Philippa Sue from Hamilton, I think she's the parrot, and then as the one and only human, you got Brian Cranston as Mac the Ringmaster. Mac, I would say, is the most interesting layered character in this entire film. Yes, he is profiting off of the animals, but at the same time, he is doing it to keep his business afloat, not that that makes it okay. But beyond that, he has a genuine love for the animals, which is really a big grounding force in this movie. We know that he loves the animals because when they fall sick, he doesn't force them to perform. He has a vet on call. And the movie makes a huge point about the fact that he has raised Ivan from childhood almost like a son. In a lot of ways, the movie is about Mac realizing that as much as he cares about the animals, he's not able to give them the life that they deserve. And in order for them to get that, he has to let go of his business and let go of Ivan. And ultimately, his character represents the human race and the actions that we need to take in order to start making amends with the animal kingdom. And that was the thing that I found the most intriguing and engaging with this film was how it evoked thought and discussion around the whole conversation about animals in captivity. Because of course your first thought is these animals need to be out in the wild. But midway through the film, we find out that Ivan is only in captivity because he was saved after his family were killed off by poachers. So then you would think, okay, it's a good thing that he is safe and sound and alive and that he's been put into the care of a loving family through Mac, right? But then also, no. Because even though Mac's heart is in the right place, he doesn't fully realize that animals can't live in captivity. But then on the flip side of that, Ivan has only known captivity his entire adult life, so he can't be reintroduced into the wild because he wouldn't survive. So what's the answer? Well, in the film, it turns out to be a zoo or an animal sanctuary. And now, is this the ideal solution? No. But it's the best solution under the circumstances. Because let's be honest, humans have put animals into this position where they are caught between a rock and a hard place, where we've endangered species in their natural habitats, but then we've also put them into captivity, which brings its own kind of misery around. So the film really presents animal sanctuaries and certain types of zoos as the best possible alternative for humans to start to make amends, which is uh, how Stella the Elephant puts it. Purely in terms of a narrative feature film, it was a cute watch. I would give the one and only Ivan maybe a 7.5 or an 8 out of 10. But purely in terms of a conversation starter, it is a perfect 10 out of 10. It deals with extremely complex issues in the simplest of ways, and it is so much more thought-provoking than just preaching animals need to be in the wild, because yes, obviously they do, but for that to be realistic, we as people need to work on ourselves first. Anyway, watch it with your family, discuss it, let me know what you think. For now, that concludes yet another episode of Teacup 401. Let me know in the comment section down below, did you watch the one and only Ivan, and what did you think? And if you want to hear me talk even more about Disney, or sometimes Shakespeare, or do even more film reviews, please uh, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, it's super easy, all you need to do is click on my face. Thanks for joining us today once again, everyone. My name is Matt and I have two degrees, and that's the T cup for one.
OK， go away。